News of the Times. Wicked Wednesdays. Blood bonds broken. Killing father. Welcome to News of the Times. In this episode, we look at three cases of fathers being killed by their grown children. The first case we briefly review is the infamous Mary Blandy case of 1752, who places love powder into her healthy and wealthy father at the supposed bidding of her erstwhile lover, Captain Cranston. Our second case from 1871 remains questionable whether the father, sliced almost in half by a scythe, is killed by accident or on purpose. And our last case from 1890 pits brother against brother as to which brother actually beat their father to death with an axe. Three Cases of Killing Father is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Mary Blandy, 1752, Murder by Love Powder We start this episode with a very quick review of the famous Mary Blandy case, which we already covered in depth in a previous episode. For those unfamiliar with the case, Mary Blandy, who is the daughter of a wealthy man, is older and facing spinsterhood. She supposedly had a fine figure, but her face has been marked by smallpox. Her father, who counted on his daughter to run the household and look after himself and her mother, was resistant to anyone being good enough to marry his daughter. With his watchful eye and her face marked by smallpox, Mary is unwed, with no real prospects despite her expected inheritance. Enter a Captain William Henry Cranston, with gambling debts, a wife and a child in Scotland, and apparently no small amount of charm, who starts to pursue Mary Blandy. Mary is entranced. Her father is not, especially when reports come back to him that the good captain already has a wife and a child in Scotland and, and also has run up huge debts. Mary's father forbids her to see him. This missive is ignored and the two secretly wed, yet... Mary and Cranston are unable to access her inheritance with her father healthy and in the way. Captain Cranston obtains some love powder, which he supposedly describes to Mary that will help her father soften his strident dislike towards the idea of their marriage. Cranston removes himself to Scotland, leaving Mary with a supposed love powder and the instructions to sprinkle the powder into her father's food. This she does indeed give to her father, who endures excruciating pain and ultimately death. Servants are suspicious and questions are asked. From the Sussex Advertiser, the 25th of November, 1751. Sworn testimony from Eliza Binfield, late servant to Francis Blandy. Elizabeth Binfield, late servant to Francis Blandy, gent, deceased upon her oath saith that about two months ago she heard Miss Blandy, his daughter, say... Who would grudge to send an old father to hell for ten thousand pounds, and saith that she hath heard her, Mary Blandy, often wish her father dead and at hell, and that he would die next October? Elizabeth Binfield saith that Mary Blandy a few days since declared that on Monday the 5th of August instant, the said Mary Blandy put some powder, which she called love powder, 
into some water gruel which was given to and eaten by her said father, and further saith that on the said day her father drank some of the water gruel, and that the, the said Mary Blandy declared to her that her said father had told her he had a ball of fire in his stomach, and that he should not be well till the same was out, and saith that on the next day, being Tuesday, her said father continued very ill, and wretched violently, and went to bed. On the Wednesday, the said Francis Blandy took physic, and about two o'clock the same day, the said Miss Blandy would have had her father taken the remainder of the said water gruel, but the other servant would not let him take it, and was going to throw it away when she espied at the bottom of the basin some white stuff, and called to Elizabeth to look at it, which she did, and the same was very white and gritty. She continued that she heard that the said Mary Blandy declared to Dr. Addington that she never gave her father any powder but once before, and that she then gave it to him in his tea, which he did not drink, as it would not mix well. Sworn as above by Elizabeth Binfield. Mary is found guilty of the murder of her father. There was also a suspicion that she had killed her mother as well, but this was never tried. Mary's motive was said to be her fierce desire to marry Captain Cranston, with a secondary aim to get her hands on the inheritance. The Mary Blandy case remains a famous one in England. Our second case takes place in Sheffield in 1871. George Henry Bishop, 18, murder by scythe. This gruesome case in Sheffield garnered much speculation in the papers at the time. Was the parricide purposeful or an accident? An independent witness helped to muddy the death further. From the Fife Herald, the 27th of July, 1871, the horrible tragedy near Sheffield, an old man killed by a scythe. On Monday afternoon, Mr. Joseph Bishop, farmer and scythe manufacturer at a village about four miles from Sheffield, went into a field where two of his sons and another person were mowing together. At the time, according to Mrs. Bishop's statement, her husband was the worst for liquor, and it is alleged that on getting into the field he had some very angry words with his son George H. Bishop, who is 18 years of age. In the course of the quarrel, it is further alleged the son struck his father a severe blow with the scythe, before the parent fell dead upon the spot. The following is the statement of the other son, Herbert Bishop, 15 years of age. My father came to us and began to abuse my brother about his mowing, and kicked him. I was not taking any particular notice, but I think my father, who was fresh at the time, fell upon the scythe. My father never spoke, but died immediately. We carried my father home on a door, and Dr. Broker was called in, but my father was dead before he came. My brother, George Henry, went to the police and gave himself up. We understand the young man, George Henry, has been a member of a primitive Methodist society and bears an excellent character. Dr. Broker states that he found a wound the underside of the left shoulder blade, cutting through the shoulder blade, the ribs, and penetrating the chest, and coming out at the neck above the collarbone close to the windpipe. Death must have been instantaneous. Mrs. Bishop is left with a family of seven children, 
the youngest of whom is seven years of age and the elder twenty. There was considerable sympathy for the young lad. The father was not particularly liked in the village, and it was confirmed that he had been both drunk and abusive to the older son when he was nearly sawn in two by the scythe the boy had been holding. The Derby Mercury, the 2nd of August, 1871. The fateful quarrel at door. Examination of the accused and his confession. On Tuesday morning, the prisoner George Henry Bishop, who was taken in the custody of Mr. Inspector Ferns before Charles Camel Esquire at Norton Hall for the purpose of being remanded. Inspector Ferns stated that the charge to be preferred against the prisoner was that of killing and slaying his father, Joseph Bishop. The prisoner was brought to the police station at Dronfield on the previous evening, charged with the above offence, and he, Mr. Ferns, and acting Superintendent Coop, immediately went to door to investigate the matter and to get up the necessary evidence against him. One person they questioned was Jonathan Mitchell, who stated that he was mowing with George and one thirty p.m. the father, Joseph Bishop, came into the field and found fault with the boy George. Some words ensued between George and the father, and the father kicked him and struck him on the side of the head with his hand. George then swung his scythe round in a passion, and the point of the blade struck the father on the back and went right through his body, coming out on his breast. He was sure the father did not fall on the scythe, and if anyone said so, it was untrue. He was five yards behind them. Inspector Fern further stated that Dr. Hogg of Dronfield, who had examined the body, gave evidence as to the cause of death. Dr. Hogg said he was called in to examine the body of the deceased on Monday evening. Some sharp instrument like a scythe had penetrated the back just under the shoulder blade and had come out a little above the centre of the breastbone. The large blood vessels had been cut through and death must have resulted almost immediately. He could not tell the direct cause of death without making a post-mortem examination. A very heavy blow would be required to have inflicted such a wound. Upon this evidence, Inspector Fern asked that the prisoner might be remanded. In court, Mr. Camel asked the prisoner if he had anything and to say why he should not be remanded, and he replied that he wished to make a statement, having received the usual caution, and the prisoner said, I, George Henry Bishop, do now resolemnly confess that my father reprimanded me for threatening my brother, and that, that he didn't desist from annoying me, I would cease mowing. My father then told me to mow wider, and when I refused, he then struck me on the side of the head and kicked me. When I lifted my scythe and cut him down, striking him in the back, my father fell and said, that thou hast killed me this time. I laid down my scythe, left the field, and gave myself up to the police. The prisoner was then remanded and was taken back to Dronfield. He now realises the serious position in which he has placed himself and appears very much distressed. From the Folkestone Chronicle, the 5th of August, 1871, the case of parricide. On the 28th, at the town hall in Dronfield, George Henry Bishop was brought up for examination on the charge of willful murder of his father by killing him with a scythe on the previous Monday, the circumstances connected with which have already appeared. 
The boyish appearance of the prisoner excited general commiseration. Mr. Fennell of Sheffield defended the prisoner, who sobbed bitterly during the examination. Herbert Bishop was cross-examined by Mr. Parnell and stated that, in his opinion, it was an accident as prisoner was mowing from right to left and the deceased stood to the left of him. Jonathan Mitchell, the old man who was mowing in company with the prisoner and his brother, in describing the fatal blow, said he did not think the prisoner struck the blow with intention, nor did he believe he saw his father at the time the scythe struck him. Dr. Hogg, in describing the wound, gave his opinion that there must have been caused by a blow and not by a fall, on account of the direction in which the weapon had passed through the body. Whether the blow was given accidentally or not, he could not say, but he thought it could not be accidental. George is found guilty of manslaughter with request for leniency by the jury. George manages to evade execution. Sadly, we have not managed to trace his history afterwards, nor that of his family. Our last case of parricide takes place in Crewe in 1890. Richard Davis, murder by beating to death by axe. This sad case also elicited considerable sympathy at the time, but not enough to change the course of the executioner. The victim, Richard Davis Sr., is by all accounts terribly cruel to his wife and family, and although he is known to have money, he refuses to give the family money for food or fuel, and has repeatedly beaten his wife almost to death. The eldest son, Richard Davis, plots his father's murder. From the St. James's Gazette, the 8th of April, 1890, The Crew Murder. Story of the crime. The facts of the case have come so recently before the public and have created so much excitement that only a brief reference to them will be necessary. The murder was committed on Saturday night, the 25th of January, on a lonely part of the road between Crew and the Howe, and that both lads were implicated in the deed was borne out both by evidence adduced at the trial and by the confessions of the murderers themselves. The murdered man, who kept a small general shop at Crewe and who was also a bookmaker, lived a great deal from home, and when he appeared to be home, he treated his wife and family in a very cruel manner. He frequently struck his wife, lived himself on superior food and took his meals alone, scarcely allowing his family money enough for bare necessities. The continued ill-treatment seems to have created in the murderers a feeling of intense hatred towards their father, with whom they were engaged in business in crew, and on the fateful Saturday a plot was arranged to kill him. During the day, both lads bought gunpowder and caps from a Mrs. Beach, and the same night the murdered man was found dead by the roadway, not shot, however, but with his head battered in with an axe, which was subsequently found. The story told by George Davis, who was with his father in the trap, was that they had been attacked by tramps, and at first this was believed. But the fact that Richard Davies came home wearing a blood-stained overcoat and other suspicious circumstances led to the arrest on the 28th of January of the real murderers, the two sons, who voluntarily confessed that they were guilty, although each gave different versions of the affair. They were subsequently committed for trial and afterwards arraigned at Chester Assizes before Mr. Justice 
Willis. In court, evidence is brought forward from the sister and mother, who both independently confirm the difficult nature of living with the now murdered Richard Davis Sr. Evidence at the trial. Emily Davis, a sister of the prisoners, was first called. She stated that on the day in question she saw her brothers several times in conversation and identified some pistols produced belonging to Richard, her brother. She said her father would not entrust Mrs. Davis with the housekeeping money and allowed her, Emily Davis, 13 shillings a week to provide for a family of eight, and out of the 13 shillings, pocket handkerchiefs and other small things were bought. The family could have meat once a week, but the father had meat every day. Albert Edward Mosley, who lived next door to the shop in Crewe, said that on the day in question he heard quarrelling in the yard and heard Mr. Davis call out to someone to loosen hold of his throat. He tried to get into the yard, but the door was fastened. Mrs. Davis, the widow, confirmed the evidence of Emily Davis. She said her husband had struck her, had threatened to shoot her, and had put a lighted newspaper under her bed and had thrashed her for sending the children to Sunday school and her son Richard had often protected her. John Davis, another son, gave evidence as to the movements of the prisoner prior to their arrest. He did not work in his father's shop himself because he could not stand the ill usage. But then the case takes a remarkable twist, with both brothers giving variations of the crime to police, basically hitting brother against brother. The first statement taken is from younger brother George Davis, who clearly places the whole of their father's murder on the shoulders of his brother Richard, referred to as Dick. From the St. James's Gazette, the 8th of April, 1890, The Crew Murder, Statements of the Prisoners. During the trial, Inspector Oldham handed in two statements which the prisoners had made to him. They were as follows. George Davis's statement. Dick got ready to go home first and went the back way out. When he got ready to go into the yard, he said, George, come here, I want you. I went to him and he said, I want you to get a, a box of pistol caps. I may not go that way. I shall come here again before I go home. You need not let Emily know what I want for you. And he then went out. About half an hour afterwards, I went down to get the caps. And when I got to the shop I stood looking through the window when someone knocked into me and I looked round and saw Dick standing there and he said have you got those caps I said no he said go and get them I went in and got them and came out of the shop I gave them to him and we both walked up Victoria Street and into John Street and stood against our trap Dick said I tell you what, I think I shall have at our old chap tonight. I said, please yourself. And he said, I meant to have a go at him on Monday night, only he picked somebody up and gave him a ride. He added, I shall get that little chopper out of the yard. I said, I should not get it because it will be missed. He said, let them miss it. You will not see me before I hit him and I shall go home, and you must come running in about ten minutes after me, and run into the house, and say someone has stopped father up on the crew lane. Then Emily came and called me, and we parted at that, and thought no more of it. I did not think he would do it, and about half past ten I and father started from the house and drove towards home in the pony trap. He stopped 
at the top of Mill Street and went into the Barrel Inn. He was in about five or ten minutes, and it was from a quarter to twenty-two minutes to eleven when he started from the top of Mill Street and went all right until we came to Crew Lane. When we got halfway down, Dick hit Father with something, and Father said, Oh dear, dear, what is that? Dick hit him again, and then he fell out of the back of the trap, and the seat fell as well. Then the pony went on a bit, and I got out and went down the lane and waited there and did not know what to do. Dick then came running down and said he thought somebody was coming, and I went across the fields and went home. I went round the lane and got home about ten minutes after Dick. I went running into the house and said father had got stopped up Crew Lane. Dick put his shoes on and ran out of the house and went to Maddox's and told them that father had got stopped, and then he ran up Crew Lane to where father was and found him dead. And I think you know all the rest. George Davis. The second statement comes from older brother Richard Davis himself, from the St. James Gazette, the 8th of April, 1890, The Crew Murder, Statement of Richard Davis. The true statement of R. Davis, I hereby confess that me and my brother George made it up to kill father on January the 25th. I left the shop at about half past eight o'clock to go home, but instead of going home, I was to wait in Crew Lane for Father to come, then was to come out of the hedge and seize the pony's head, while George, who was riding with him, should jump up and strike him, which he did do. And after George had struck him two or three times, I ran behind and got hold of him from behind and pulled him out of the trap. Then George got out of the trap. I went home and left him there until he was dead. Then he was to come home, saying that they had been stopped in Crew Lane by two men. I arrived home at about eleven o'clock, and in about ten minutes to a quarter of an hour, George came and told us. I ran and got him first, but he was on the opposite side to where I had left him, and quite dead. I took his money out of his pocket, and then Jack, my elder brother, came up. The calls had for it was because he was such a bad father, not to me exactly, but to George and the rest, and a bad husband to mother, for mother and them having been very nearly starved sometimes, for he would neither buy them coal for the fire nor meat to eat when he was in a bad temper. But may the Lord forgive us, we never thought what a crime we were committing, nor the consequences of it, and I hope the law will deal mercifully with me and George. We don't deserve it, I know, but let it be for the sake of my mother and my little brothers. Spare one of us. Who to believe? Ultimately, the recovered, blood-stained clothing of Richard Davis condemned him, and he was sentenced to death. From the St. James's Gazette, the 8th of April, 1890, The Crew Murder, The Execution of Richard Davis The prisoners sentenced to death. The jury found the prisoners guilty with recommendation to mercy, and they were sentenced to death. Richard Davis maintained that his version of the murder was the correct one, and at the last he wrote a letter saying that he hoped George would tell the truth, but George showed no disposition to alter his story. A large number of petitions were signed asking that the condemned lads might be reprieved, and last week the Home Secretary intimated that George alone would be spared. An agitation was then got up for the reprieve of Richard Davis also, on the ground that both 
should be treated alike. But the Home Secretary declined to alter his decision, with the result that Richard Davis this morning paid the utmost penalty of the law for his offence. Richard was executed at Nutsford Jail for the murder of his father, whilst George Davis was ultimately sentenced to transportation. Three cases of parricide for love as a possible accident and for revenge. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Blood Bonds Broken, Killing Father. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.